Walt was making lemonade. Esther would have rolled her eyes at the thought of frozen concentrate. Walt was making lemonade. Esther would have rolled her eyes and shaken her head at the thought of frozen concentrate in her kitchen, but Walt figured he was 84 years old and there were things that he would rather be doing with his time than squeezing lemons. Shane was out the back, trimming the hedge. Walt could see him through the kitchen window. He always stuck around when the work was done for uh, a chat. And Walt just, he loved that. He loved his chance to play grandpa. He loved to hear what Shane had to say. He'd always been the kind of person that people felt that they could talk to. Even when he was Shane's age, his friends would come to him and, and tell him their troubles and, and Walt would listen, especially in an age when they were a generation heading for war. And maybe that was something that he recognized in Shane, a bit of that that young and loving and maybe a little too strong for your own good person. Walt and Shane were a pair, the young fool and the old fool. Way back then, when the war came, Walt and his friends had signed up and Walt had spent a lot of time fighting in Italy. His company had won some and lost far too much. But the guys had started calling him Vicar, <laughs> the company comforter, their shoulder to lean on, someone who was strong because he drew strength from his faith and God had brought him through intact, his faith and his spirit. And knowing, somewhat surprised, what it was that he wanted to do for the rest of his life. An Anglican priest. <laughs> what a life. 60 years of walking through everyone's joys and sorrows. He hadn't been ordained long when he met Esther. He had been eating alone in a diner tucked into a booth and she had walked in with her friends and they all sat at the counter. And she had those big soft Lana, Kerner, Lana Turner curls on her neck. There was a mirror on the wall in front of her and Walt had to shift in his seat just a little bit to see her better. Their eyes met once or twice in the mirror. The first time she smiled politely. The second time she looked a little uncomfortable and whispered to her friend and the friend turned and looked at him out of the corner of her eye and Walt realized he was wearing his collar so he walked over and the three girls spun around on their stools they were on guard and at attention Walt's first words to Esther were I'm Anglican I'm allowed to flirt. She had laughed and said, nice to meet you, Anglican. I'm Esther. It was two years before they could get married because he wasn't earning much and she was in teacher's college. But finally, finally they had settled into the vicarage at St. Stephen's and she was teaching and he was pastoring and he was so happy. <laughs> He loved Esther and he loved Jesus and he loved working alongside God and people. He loved the way people trusted him. He loved being trustworthy. He loved seeing their foreheads relax when he said just the right thing at just the right time and how much it meant to them when he told them that God would never give them more than they could handle. If he was allowing something to happen in their lives, it was because he knew that they could handle it. Walt had said that a lot. 
he genuinely loved these people. And he loved Jesus. And he knew that he was serving God. And Esther was wonderful. And Jesus was wonderful. And life was wonderful. Until they lost faith. That was the name that they gave her. Little girl, too small to open her eyes. It was winter and they couldn't even bury her properly. There wasn't a funeral. After the war, after so much death, people weren't yet ready to say goodbye to someone who hadn't even been born. So Walt and Esther grieved privately. They spent hours in each other's arms saying nothing. Because for the first time in his life, Walt had nothing to say. He had no answers. He had no strength. Praying was like talking to the floor. He'd take out his Bible and read those same verses that he had read to other people that they had found so comforting. But the words had died too. He was a man who had fought and killed and won through in the worst war the world could remember, only to be completely undone by a tiny girl he had never even held. He was 30 years old, a reverend, loving God, loved by God, spending his life telling people about God's love and goodness, giving them a reason to hope, a reason to get up again tomorrow morning, being strong, being a tower, a shoulder to lean on, and he was helpless. And the worst part of it was that this loss was more than they could handle. God had allowed something to come into their lives that was more than they could handle. And the shock of that alone was more than they could process. Walt realized he'd been stirring the lemonade for a while now and he could probably stop. He put the jug in the fridge and took a couple of glasses from the cupboard. Shane was nearly finished with the hedge. Walt and Esther had retired into this neighborhood seven years ago and right away noticed the little boy playing in his yard down the block. They would drive out past Tony and Meg's house and Shane would be there crouched behind a hedge like James Bond with a revolver or leaping out from behind a tree with a stick sword fighting a dragon. Then one time he had been sitting alone between the hedge and the maple tree, just staring at the sky. No more secret agent, no more brave knight. Walt would stand in his front window and often see young Shane by himself with a stack of comic books or one of those little game things or just thinking. And then one winter he turned up on their front step wanting to shovel the driveway and they'd invited him in for hot chocolate. And the boy had talked and talked and talked about school and hockey and his future career as a rock star. He set up their computer, he got their internet running. One time he brought his guitar and played them a song about going to a club. None of them had ever been to a club, but Esther said it was wonderful, so it probably was. And there was only one thing that Shane would not talk about. How's your mom? Fine. How's your dad? Fine. It was months before he trusted them enough for it to all come out. They weren't fine. and He didn't know what to do. He just wanted them to be happy again. He tried not to be any trouble. He tried to look after himself, to keep his worries to himself so they wouldn't worry about him, but it wasn't helping. And, and when Shane had said everything he had to 
say, he kind of petered out into, you know? And Walt and Esther had looked at each other and nodded and said that yes, they knew. They knew what it was to try to be strong, to try not to be any trouble, to be good. And they knew that it didn't work and that it would kill you in the end. After they'd lost faith, they had to pull themselves together and put on their happy faces and go on looking like they were still what they had always been and only the two of them knew that they weren't. Only they knew that God had abandoned them and they were alone in the universe and they just didn't know how to jump off the train they were on until one sleepless night one angry night the fury just got to Walt he was going to have it out with God he went next door to the church and let himself in he stood in the pulpit in the dark in his pajamas and slippers and he raised his fists and he shouted at God he called him names he used language he hadn't used since he was in the army and all the anger and grief and pain and betrayal bounced off the walls and the ceiling and the stained glass windows. Those windows. There were 20 of them, pictures from the life of Christ. One was catching the light from the street lamps. And when Walt ran out of obscenities and breath and slumped down into a chair, it caught his eye like he'd never seen it before. At the top, <clears throat> it said, Christ falls under the cross. At the bottom, it said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Walt would never, ever, ever forget the feeling in his arms and his legs as he sat there with words filling his mind, words from somewhere else, and he would never forget the silent voice that said, Walt, my son, I fell under that cross because it was more than I could handle. Sometimes life's like that. I know I've been there. I know that your heart is broken. I know you've lost more than you ever even thought you'd want. But dear child, you've lost something else. You've lost your understanding that even though I gave you a gift for guiding others, it's not your job to have all the answers. It's just your job to know that I am the answer. You can't handle it. Not alone. You're not supposed to. Trust me. Know that my heart is broken too. And then the silent voice was gone. Walt's heart was quiet, still hurting, but quiet. And for the first time in years, he was crying. Tears of grief for the faith that they'd lost and tears of joy for the faith that he still had. Tears of gratitude for Esther, for Jesus, for life. As soon as his legs would work again, he'd walked down the aisle, locked the door behind him, and Walt had gone home. Home to Esther and home to Jesus. The hedge trimmer turned off. Walt wiped his eyes with his hanky and
took a sip of water to ease the tightness in his throat. He stepped out onto the back porch with a tray of lemonade and some cookies as Shane came up the steps and Walt smiled at his adopted grandson and settled in for a chat.